Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. Ron will not be joining us today. But I'm here and I'm Jean Marie. And I'm Lita. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we're talking about the complex world of metastatic mucosal melanoma with Chris White. Chris had a heck of a journey beginning in the summer of 2018 where he believed that he had a hemorrhoid and it turned out to be cancer and not just any cancer. So we're going to learn about this story. Um, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Good to be here. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hi, Chris. This is Jean. To start us off, what exactly is metastatic mucosal melanoma? Because it is quite a mouthful. It, it is. So starting off with metastatic, meaning that it's uh, it's metastasized, it's left its original location, uh, which is normally you would refer to as stage four in most cancers. Okay. Um, but mucosal melanoma uh, makes up 1% of all melanomas and it forms in mucous membranes. And so uh, anywhere uh, up in the head and neck area, you have a lot of sinonasal, hard palate sort of thing. And then, then regions below, you'll have anal rectal or vulva vagina, but anywhere in the body where you have a mucous membrane, you can get mm -hmm. melanoma. Okay. And that's what well, it is. Okay. And what symptoms first led you to seek medical care? Well, uh, I, I had a growth on my rectum uh, and I didn't do anything about it until I ended up having an additional growth growing my groin. And so at that point, you know, I definitely knew that something was going on and I needed to go get looked at. I think a lot of a lot. I'm, I, okay. a lot of people. I can't say that a lot of people mm -hmm. ignore <laughs> physical attributes because they're worried about the worst. Mm -hmm. Were you worried that it might be something serious? You know, uh, maybe subconsciously or like really deep down, but on the surface of everything at the time, I had an issue with you know leaving work. Um, you know, and taking the time to go see the doctor. And even though I had insurance and everything, you know, uh, it was a busy time for me. And so, you know, just that feeling of knowing, okay, the, the more I'm not here at work, you know, uh, I'm taking time away from this. And so it was something I thought I could just put off okay, and do, okay. and do later. Yeah. Okay. And then Chris, so you had, you went in it, it, and let me know if I have this right. You went in, um, for the lump in your groin and they kind of said we can go in and if it is a hernia we'll fix it if it's not a hernia we'll biopsy it and either way you know we'll we'll do what we can and then while you're waiting for that biopsy result to come back you went to get your um your rectum looked at and that physician said you know what i it's not it's not uh hemorrhoid, hemorrhoid. Yeah. it it looks like it could be cancer um and and then so you were waiting for one biopsy while you're basically getting another one. How did you handle that? Because that's a lot, of, a lot to take in. You know that uh, I had the surgery for the first lymph node in my groin on a Monday. You know, because I recall because I took the entire week off of work. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, because I was like, if I'm gonna, you know, go get looked at, I'm gonna make sure I cover all of my bases. So you know, I made sure. That Surgery was on a Monday and I had time throughout the week to go do my other appointments. And so, you know, I had that surgery on the Monday um, and that was on July 2nd. And so I knew I just kind of had to hang out um, through July 4th. And my appointment I made with the proctologist was, you know, the following day. And so I just tried to um, try to relax and, and not think about it. Uh, you know, I, I knew I couldn't do anything about it at the moment. So I didn't want to get myself all worked up. But it okay. was, um, you know, it was a definitely weird time trying to, trying to, you know, process and wait for everything. Okay. And how common is this type of cancer? You said 1% of... Yeah, it sounds so, very rare. Yeah. So um, it makes up 1% of all melanoma. So most of the time, you know, you would hear uh, skin cancer, cutaneous melanoma. That is the most common. You know, skin is the most largest organ in your body, you right. know, believe it or not. And... um it's you know, melanoma is one of the most uh, deadly cancers that's out there. And so the, uh, the subtypes for, you know, are, are still in those groups. And so, 
uh, out of all melanoma, uh, you know, the majority of it is obviously all cutaneous and skin, but then you have these other small subgroups and out of those subgroups, you'll have acral, um, ocular, and some of the other ones. And so, you know, you get down to specifics, but out of all that, mucosal melanoma only makes up 1%. And so it's, I believe one, uh, or, or excuse me, two every like 10 million is kind of the, uh, the odds or something like that, or one every five or 6 million, you know? somebody will get this type of melanoma maybe like 700 or so within the united states a year okay all right it's and then rare. When, they, when they say when they say um skin mm -hmm. so the internal like the digestive system that's also well, no he, the mucosal areas he's saying anywhere that the sun doesn't shine and is moist okay is exactly mucosal. Yeah. okay okay mucous membranes it, mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you um and chris being in texas are you more cognizant of, you know, cancers and skin cancers? And were you more likely to go in and get, you know, a skin check? And have had you ever even heard of metastatic mucosal melanoma? You know, I, I actually grew up in Southern California for, oh, okay. uh, from 1988 to uh, 96. And that was during my, all of my middle school and elementary years uh, and okay. everything. And so I was very active and busy out in Southern California during that time, and, you know, between going to the pool, being on swim team, being at the beach. And so I just grew up around sun safety. And so okay. we used, you know, uh, old frog, real strong, you know, uh, sunscreen, sunscreen right. and just, you know, knew to reapply, you know, just if you're going to the beach, you had a buddy, rub it on your back and just make sure everybody was taken care of. And so I, uh, you know, I knew about sun safety and everything, but I never actually had been to a dermatologist. I, you know, I didn't know at a certain age what, you know, the, the recommendation was and i was always real safe about everything nothing on my actual skin ever bothered me i had a birthmark i had removed when i was 14 but other than that that was it and so i i had no clue in the world that you know you could get melanoma where the sun doesn't shine and that it even mm -hmm. existed and so just this exists it's just completely you know baffled me right yeah okay. big yeah. big surprise yeah. all the way around yeah Chris, yeah how, how how has your medical team chosen to treat that cancer so in the beginning uh, they were wanting to treat it systemically you know i started off at up here in north dallas and so i was with texas apology and they had brought me in and uh, i had got my pet scans done but they immediately recommended me down to see a specialist and get a second opinion so to go to md anderson uh, but so while i was waiting to go to md anderson i had my first two initial surgeries uh, you know, I got my pet staging and when I got down there, you know, the, met with all the different medical teams and everything. And um, a lot of the treatments were still in clinical trial say, so there was no standard of care. And so anything I would be doing would be, you know, all in that. But he said that, you know, systemic treatments were going to be the thing. And it wasn't chemotherapy like you thought. Always talking about going with cell therapy and that'd be, um, you know, immunotherapies like Optivo, Keytruda, you know, as a single dose, doing those in conjunction. And then if it got worse, we did, you know, go into double dose, but it wasn't going to be the traditional, let's do, you know, your radiation surgery, chemo and, and move on. This was going to be something very different. So it was always immunotherapy was going to be our, our main uh, weapon. Okay. Is that what TII therapy is? So, so TIL? Uh, oh, um, TIL, a, sorry, yeah. In, in a sense, you know, I ended up getting into that after all my options had changed. But uh, yeah, that's where the whole concept for that comes from because it uses your body's own immunity to fight off the cancer. And okay. so... That, yes, that idea uh, originated, I believe, uh, in the 1960s by a United States doctor. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know, but but was that something that was readily available for you? No, well, it was all all in the clinical trial stage. Um, you know, the immunotherapies that were out at the time, you know, were um, a couple of single agent immunotherapies plus combination immunotherapies, um, and so that was always the get go. But in between all of my treatments, if there was if it was getting out of hand, we would use something alternately to you know, fight it. But the whole concept with my team was keep doing something, you know. And how, uh, how know, long of a, how long of a period are we talking that you had this? 18 months. Okay. Okay. 
And I understand that at one point in order to be accepted in a clinical trial, you had to take some extreme measures when you found out that the cancer had spread to your occipital lobe. Yes. Um, I mean, like it, it, this, I couldn't write this out as like a more dramatic type of script. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, when I think about it, but yeah, just imagine. So, you know, for a little over a year, you know, you, or a year and a half, you're fighting this disease, which they don't know what causes it. They don't know how to prevent it. And therefore, they're basically, they don't have a, a standard of care for it. You know, their standard of care reverts back to like what they would do for, you know, cutaneous melanoma talking you know mm-hmm. surgery and that sort of thing and so uh, just those factors playing in was just extremely scary and so um that's give me a second here no yeah that's all right um yeah so going through the full 18 months uh it was the initial surgeries and then I did radiation and at there that point I was going into scan and I literally thought that I was going to be clean and this was like within November of that year and so um, I still hadn't really delved into looking up mucosal melanoma on the internet I didn't really do any research because when I did go to do that it was extremely scary and mm-hmm. very vague um, and just a big downer and so I just I for my positivity and, and self health I, I couldn't be going to the internet so i was super positive going into my scans and when my scans came back that it metastasized to my lungs and my liver and that's the picture i often show everybody where i i just i lit up like a christmas tree all throughout my chest and everything you know it would became very real that you know you we got to attack this hard and we got to attack this this fast so you know the known treatments was okay we immediately would go into combination immunotherapy and then uh it, one point when that was just things were still getting excessive we put that on pause and then went to chemo for the time being uh you know and then brought in a single agent immunotherapy decided to do more radiation and then after things were looking better you know we went back you know continued to stay aggressively with combination immunotherapy now most of the time most patients only get about three or four doses of the combination immunotherapy but they started me over as if it was round one and i did an additional four so oh, altogether, wow. you know, you add that, uh, you know, I had six combination immunotherapies plus one single digit on top of, you know, uh, chemotherapy and radiation all compiled within a few months of each other. And then I just, I got completely sick um, mm-hmm. with colitis and, you know, but the amount of therapy I did within that time frame, I think, because we attacked it so aggressively, you know, they're all working in conjunction with each other, overlapping each other, you know, and so by the time I got done with that it was still within my system you know that's the whole point of cell therapy and immunotherapy is it's it's not like the immediate you you know inject it in and then you know you're good that day or the next day it's a long working uh you know type of therapy and so you know but that that was the no thing and so when it came time that everything was continuing to progress till therapy um, you know since it's been around for quite a while Mm -hmm. there's many different organizations that that do this uh, kind of a therapy, but where I was being treated at, uh, they didn't have it anymore. There was another biopharma company that came and bought it from them, and so uh, they uh, they but so they pointed me to the next specialist to get into it. So that's when I went up to Colorado. But um, it was always be very aggressive. The uh, cell therapy is going to be the you know how we're going to try to feed this because. You know, we can cut it out, but it's known to metastasize, it's known to come back, and it's it's like whack-a-mole. As soon as it sees that you're coming for it, it runs. <laughs> okay. And were you able to, um, and I know we're going to talk about friends and family later, but um, were you able to, you know, get accommodations and things in Colorado when you were getting, you know, treatment there? You know, the, since it was a clinical trial, uh, they they pay for the actual drug and everything but i still had mm-hmm. to pay for my hospital stays you know that was another reason was the hospital that was out there i was going to was right next to where my grandparents had lived and so okay. I, I did have a local place uh, i had grandparents i had aunts and uncles um and cousins and other family out there so there i had that support system close by and uh, i knew i could count on them and rely on them 
And so that was all there, but there was no additional like stipends or um, extra scholarships, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. any of that. I mean, I, I still had to rely a lot on my own income that I was making through work. And then I, you know, went on from short term disability to long term disability and, and used everything I could. But uh, yeah, the financial toxicity, you know, can get pretty bad because you still have to pay for uh, You have to have insurance because you have to do the follow up scans. You have to mm -hmm. pay for your hospital stay and um, and all of that. So, but and, that would have been really to cool. That, prior to that, uh, I know you worked in the home building business. Is that right? Yeah, yes, ma'am. That's correct. New home construction. Were you basically self-employed with that or did you have right. an employer that provided insurance? I, I had an employer that provided insurance. So, okay. yeah, I worked with one of well, the bigger convenient. builders. Yeah, a lot yes. of people yeah. just don't have anything to go on. Uh, and... And when you your body started to uh, succumb to all of the stress and mm -hmm. everything that it was going through, um, were you able to, you know, like how, well, I shouldn't say were you, how did you come back from that and what role did nutrition play and what role does nutrition play in your life now? Because I understand, you know, when you're feeding yourself, you're also feeding, feeding the, the, yeah. So um, nutritionally, I I completely did a 180 on just the cognizant, you know, being cognizant of what I was eating and, and where it's coming from. Um, uh, processed foods, fast food. It, I just, I never paid attention to it before. And so, uh, knowing what I've become to know now about nutrition and how the body works, um, you know, with being alkaline and, you know, what you put in it and everything. And I go to look at, you know, the history of it all. And it's like, people have been eating, you know, for thousands of years, it's only been within the last, you know, couple of hundred that we started figuring out how to, you know, process it and do all this, you know, alternative stuff into it. And so I, uh, so I don't doubt it at all that, that nutrition has a huge part to play in it. And I recently, uh, you know, just been getting more into, uh, you know, making smoothies and just double checking, you know, my labels, you know, that's the, when I bring up smoothies, that's what's replaced in my sweet tooth, you know, like eating frozen okay. fruit. Like I just mm -hmm. love it now. <laughs> I mean, it's so, um, it, uh, the nutrition part of it just completely is everything. Um, uh, I can't, I can't even begin to explain on how uh, I just, they don't know what caused my cancer. And every time mm -hmm. I think about it, I just think about all the, the, um, the bad things that I put in my body and just let, but also like the way it would make me feel, you know? And so. You know, you you are what you eat in a sense, and so if you're putting uh, non-healthy things into your body, then that's also how you're you know you're gonna look and feel. So, um, but I think it has well, a huge part to play with it. But but it's not just it's not just the idea that oh this is better for you. You actually took that idea and ran with it and did what you needed to do to heal. A lot of people can't do that. So, kudos to you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I, I simplify it sometimes by using a movie reference, and I often tell people that when I was going through everything, I look at it like I, you know, played Tyler Durden in Fight Club, you know, the the Brad Pitt role. So it's just I kind of came outside of myself, and I was just, you know, this is the positivity I'm gonna just exuberate, and just I completely flooded it with it. And so when things i finished my last treatment and things were calming down and everything and i'm into recovery it's kind of like the everything the, the dust just kind of settles and so uh it, it's been very interesting over the last couple of years uh you know recuperating from from all of that and you know i didn't i wasn't going into any therapy or anything within that time and so you know i'm kind of catching up on you know a couple of couple of years of you know holding it in right right well good for you again I mean, you're taking all the right steps. Chris, what helped you get through some of the time that you had to do traveling and all the hospital stays and treatment periods? Ultimately, it was it was my family and uh, my parents. Um, I put all my stuff in storage and I moved in with them. Uh, I spent you know pretty much equal time you know sharing between you know both of them. I, I moved in with my mom and stayed there for many months. And then after a while, I, I moved in and stayed with my father and. You know, actually, because of all this, I was able to still save money uh, because I was going in and out of disability through work. 
um, right, right. you know, because ultimately I had to keep insurance. I mean, no matter what I did, I, I that was always at the top of my my mind because I needed to see specialists. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, my family they were they would drive me down to all my major appointments because I had to go from Dallas to Houston to go see the specialist down there. Um, and that's where I also did my radiation and another surgery. And so, you know, they, without, uh, even asking or anything, they, they took care of, you know, driving down there, hotels, you know, um, food, you know, it's you know, food while we're there, food on the drive, um, that sort of thing. You know, they didn't want me to have to try to worry about that financial part of it, which I was really grateful, you know, that they wanted to help come along and do all that because mm -hmm. that would have been an additional, you know, stress, mm -hmm. um, up top of the current stresses if that was another thing, but they, uh, that they were pretty much it um you know they everywhere i went those were i always made sure i had somebody with me so as note taker you know to keep everything and so they were my eyes and my ears and um and basically my kind of my confidants you know like in my advisors if you will like whatever the doctor said I just kind of looked at them and so them being there and being able to play that role for me um i i can't stress enough on how how grateful i, I am for that and how much that means in other you know patients if you can able to have somebody with you as much as you can on everything you go to do, that in itself will just alleviate a lot of things, but all of the, everything. Good. At, yeah, that's one thing that we really push for is uh, every patient needs an advocate. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs somebody on their side to go with them to doctors. Like you're saying, take notes, because once they mention that C word, you can't think about anything else. It's yes, all gone. Right. Oh, Chris, yeah. what, what's the most misunderstood aspect of metastatic mu mucosal melanoma? Uh, the most misunderstood aspect, I would say, is because it shares the name melanoma. And mm -hmm. so it gets grouped and it gets booked in with, you know, other uh, like cutaneous melanoma. Uh, I even had family members up until not too terribly, you know, long ago who still thought that, you know, the melanoma I had was, you know, like cutaneous. You didn't understand the aggressiveness. And it's come to understand is, you know, because it's uh, it forms in mucous membranes, you don't necessarily always get diagnosed until you're at stage three or four because you, you don't feel it. You know, you, you can look completely great walking around, you know, looking just you know, beautiful is all and not know about how just cancer riddling throughout your body. And so it works from the inside out. And the way they mm -hmm. treat it is that they, they don't go at it the same way like they would do with other cancers or even just regular melanoma by cutting it out or using those other therapies. Mm -hmm. And so because of the aggressiveness is they say, you know, within about five years, you have about 14% chance to, you know, to make it five years. And, uh, that is pretty much across the board. That's, it's been for a while. I'm celebrating my, um, five year anniversary actually here this next month. Um, and then once it metastasized there, you know, you're looking at maybe less than a year. And so that's, it is that aggressive. And once it gets into your lymphatics and it starts, you know, going through, you, you mainly have your lungs, your liver, your kidneys, and uh, your brain. And once it gets to your brain, you have that, uh, that membrane, um, but going back to the occipital lobe, once it mm -hmm. goes to there, you, um, you can't, uh, it basically kicks you out of everything and stops it because your blood doesn't flow throughout your brain like it does throughout the rest of your body, you know, and you have all your veins and your main arteries and everything. Once it gets up to your brain, you have this membrane that, you know, kind of stops and separates it. You don't have all the veins running through it. So, um, it, once it gets metastatic, you have to, you know, treat it like I did. Um, and I ended up doing the radiation. Um, and since there's always a timeline, you know, especially with the clinical trial, like in my case, it was, um, you got to get five sessions, uh, but you got to get insurance approval first just to make the mask. And so all these things count up. And when you have um, 14 days total, which, you know, then you take out the weekends, you're looking at 10 business days. We had to spend the first six getting insurance, then the seventh, you know, getting the mask made. And so I didn't have my five days. So that's why I did my five sessions in four days and then scan the next day, which was Christmas Eve. Uh, and then had the way to see the results and, you know, the results come through, they pop up on the portal, you know, I can go look at them, but oh, knowing what one. I know now, it was, it yeah. actually, it went, it, it's, it was a kind of a pseudo progression because, you know, when you go and activate and irritate, you know, a mass with radiation, it'll go up before it comes down. 
you know, the okay. inflammation and, and they, they knew based on the, the way the scan looked that that's what had happened. And so, you know, they let me back in, but I had to wait from like Christmas Eve until just right after New Year's that year, wondering what was going to happen. That's when I had to go fill out my will. Um, you know, and I was just, I literally had somebody come stay with me 24 hours a day and just sit with me. I kept on having this fear that I was going to die alone, you know, um, and I was real hesitant on filling anything out because I didn't want to give and believe that, you know, that was a possibility, but I, I had to do it going into this trial, but it is just so aggressive, um, you know, that it's most people, I think by the time it metastasized, it, I don't know if there's a pathology miscommunication somewhere to where they're not getting assessed because I'll hear about all the time what kind of cancer do you got and they're like oh, I don't know it's just everywhere well, what's your primary what's the pathology and they don't know they just know it's bad and it's everywhere and so I really wonder if it's it's more prevalent but everything that's been you know recorded it's just it's going to show that it's an extremely a aggressive cancer uh, you know about 50% of all mucosal melanoma so I, you take that all of middle melanoma and you have one percent and then you take that one percent fifty percent of that is up in the head and nose ear and throat but mm -hmm. the other you know fifty percent out of that you got maybe 25 anal rectal and then maybe 20 or so um, you know vulva and then another miscellaneous i mean but it's and it's the, the the lower in the regions you go it's known that we've just seen that, that it gets more aggressive and okay. so you know they don't know what caused it so they don't know how to attack it a lot of the times they'll use a prior um you know kit mutation or you know they'll go get you know they'll go get your you know tested to find out if you have a gene mutation mm -hmm. um, and then they'll try to target it like that like you would with you know other cutaneouses but they've gone to show that even if you have a mutation it's not necessarily gonna you know sway one way or the other whether it works uh, and that's the crazy part about mucosal melanoma which makes it so incredibly aggressive is that they will uh you, you don't know if it's gonna you know attack you now or attack you later a lot of people you know will get net for two years and then a little lesion will come back and then boom Ooh. so it's it's hard you, to say you, you've learned so much yeah <laughs> since that's your all illness. I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean that's amazing um and it, it, we really appreciate you sharing all of that knowledge because, you know, nowadays you're in the doctor's office for five minutes and you don't know right. what was said. But Right. And I know um, when you were when you said about the portal, um, because yeah. you can get your medical results so rapidly, I know certain states are making it so that uh, a physician can um, pause information from being instantly supplied to the patient where they feel like they need to sit down and talk the information over with the patient before they read it at home and, you know, in a situation where they maybe don't have someone there to support them. Yeah. And yeah, that you've had some real challenges. Yeah, we're, we're actually, we just taped a, uh, an episode on AI and medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another aspect of AI and medicine that needs to be addressed. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, away from you for one second for our advertising <laughs> to better serve our listening audience we affiliate with a major medical supply house here in the united states and you'll find affiliate links on our website podcastdx.com uh, they aim to tailor specific medical supplies and equipment based on your diagnoses and to make it less stressful than looking through an entire catalog for what you might need we're open to your suggestions and will adjust our offerings based on what you, our listeners and guests, find helpful. But now back to uh, Chris. Do alternative therapies such as massage, acupuncture, acupressure, uh, heat or ice, do they, did they help alleviate any symptoms while you were going through treatment? Oh, yeah, uh, most definitely. Uh, I mean, you could get... A anything from neuropathy uh, to colitis. Um, and so anything that can just make you be a little bit more comfortable, feel at ease. Um, it's once I, uh, once a metastasized, you know, that it, it starts spreading, um, you could often get cancer related pain. Um, and uh, what I've come to notice, like with my personal uh, fight with all that was if I was trying to just uh, wait for the pain to kick in, um, I was always chasing it. And so the doctor was telling me, you know, you got to stay ahead of pain because it's not like you just had an injury and it's healing and it's going away. I mean, you like, you know, you, you have cancer related pains pressing on nerves. Um, and so, you know, 
uh, depending on where it's at, you know, get with your care team on, you know, what kind of medications might be able to help it alleviate in conjunction. But um, I would never turn down a massage, uh, whether it was anything from a pedicure, um, you know, or just, uh, or, you know, a back massage, shoulder massage, um, anything that would go through, um, you know, to try to just kind of lessen up, you know, the muscles, but not be too intense, you know, um, so that would help. Uh, in my recovery care, I did start going to uh, chiropractors, you know, I did notice that helped a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of uh, other kinds of different therapies, uh, you know, I, w I would love to try acupuncture, but um, I've, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of good things about that in ice baths. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I myself haven't um, been, been going through that when I went through all my treatment, but those are some of the things that I would do. Okay. Okay. Well, what about um, things like uh, when you were, were going for therapies or you had to, you know, go through a treatment, um, you know, like listening to music or reading or anything to keep your mind distracted? Most definitely. So when I was doing most of my systemic therapy, I would always bring my iPad with me uh, and, uh, you know, scroll through and there'd be like a series on Netflix or okay. something, you know, mm -hmm. and something you could stream. Uh, mm -hmm. or that you could download on your streaming device and be able to watch so that you can just kind of stare into that and then kind of forget that that's where you're at and that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, so that was pretty helpful, but just something to keep your mind busy. You know, you don't want to really be making phone calls, but, you know, uh, you know, if you want to play little solitaire games or, you know, whatnot, or then uh, I would always have a notepad with me as well, um, you know, so I could write. Uh, they always had snack stations, and so, you know, trying times to eat or anything that, you know, you could eat really i mean just you know take advantage of that that would always help i got it i had a blanket that was made from some family that i would take with me to everywhere uh you know that had all my nieces and nephews on it oh, and so you I know i that. said we love you uncle chris and so any hospital stay you know i try to make sure i had you know something familiar from home you know reminders of the family uh and everything that i could po post up or just have close by you know mm -hmm. physical reminders you know it, do it did a lot for my mentality but uh but music would, you know, I, I can't say enough about how much music got me through everything. I mean, it literally, I could feel like different. It would oftentimes, you know, um, you know, make me cry. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it, it would completely change my mindset. And the most memorable moment I have from all that when I was going through my clinical trial, um, right after they did you your tilt, they did you um, doses of IL-2, um, which is interleukin. And uh, when you get these doses of that, it gives that one of the side effects uh, that possible to get is rigors. And the rigors experience when you're compulsively shaking, you got a fever, um, you know, you, you feel freezing, but, you know, but you're running the fever. And so we're having multiple blankets, you know, warm blankets dressed over me. Uh, you get extremely thirstier in this time. So, you, you know, you got people with the straws and those big cups feeding you water. Um, uh, but the shaking gets so bad. I mean, it just hurts and hurts and hurts. And so, mm -hmm. um, as they, uh, this really lasted about 30 minutes or so. Uh, and so I, through the trial, they would give you some pain meds intravenously as that was kicking in. And so I, um, would turn on, you know, my, uh, whatever device I had and, and play like some of my, you know, most hardcore, like rock and stuff to get the energy pumped up and going. And that would kind of get me through like a couple of songs, you know, and I would be mm -hmm. focusing on that rather than the Rigers. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, my father even called it Rigers rap, you know, because if it was a <laughs> hip hop song or, you know, or a rock, you know, it's, I would literally be jamming along. Like I was doing karaoke and I didn't care like yeah. how loud I got or who, you know, mm -hmm. who was around, but um, okay. but yeah, that, and then after that I would pass out, but I remember thinking like, you know, music make me feel so good that if I can just mm -hmm. enjoy this little part of it for, you know, this really un, un, you know, horrible feeling part of it, you know, that'll, that'll at least get me through that. And that'll, you know, it, music was everything still is. I, yes, it is. Uh, I'm going to switch places with Jean cause oh. she's over there crying. I'm sorry. Uh, That's why I'm not, one of the many reasons I'm not on camera. <laughs> okay. uh, Chris, what are some of the less apparent parts of your life that have been affected by this disease? Um, the, uh, the chronic fatigue, you know, that okay. I deal with, a lot of the chronic pain I still have to deal with, um, yeah, a lot of the, the mental health kind of stuff. You know, when I was going through recovery was uh, when 2020 was in the early, you know, early 2020. And that's right when COVID hit. I got out of the hospital in January 2020. 
and I had to um, go back to work by May 1st or I was going to have to cover my insurance. And so uh, I had to get my eyes fixed because the immunotherapy um, had caused me conjunctivitis, UVIs, and I developed cataracts, you know, prior to my wow. clinical trial. And mm-hmm. so I, I was on this timeline again to get my eyes fixed, um, you know, and then try to physically rehab myself to get back to work. And I could go to work because I was essential, but I couldn't go to in-person therapy. And I ended up having lots oh. of anxiety um, and everything. And I was going to the doctors. I ended up having um, a stress test and a bronchoscopy because I couldn't explain this. So I did an extra scan and, and you know, I did have an infection, but they, they didn't want to do anything because... That, but the medical costs, you know, never stop because I uh, have to continue to scan every three months, do full body CTs, um, head, neck, and then also brain MRIs. Um, and so that continues, uh, you know, I still got to have insurance. Uh, you know, I was really doing really well at work, uh, but my type of job, you know, it can be both physically and mentally draining. And mm-hmm. after a couple of years, um, uh, you know, going back into recovery, I... I kind of just, it all kind of boiled up for me. And, um, I kind of just had a, this mental, you know, I don't know if I call it a mental breakdown or what it was, but I had got let go of my job and I was happy about it because I, um, I just, it was so exhausting to go to work. You know, I would come home, you know, do the Monday through Friday thing. It wasn't intensive, but I would be so tired. But when I come home that if I didn't eat and shower, like I wouldn't do it. You know, and then, um, it, it would get to the weekend and then I'd just be so tired from the, week that on the weekend I wouldn't do anything and then my metabolism was off I was trying to um come off of all the painkillers that they had put me on during my treatment you know I was on what they had called a comfort pack so there's not like a official rehab program you know set up and so you know I had to come off of the fentanyl patch over time and then try to come off the hydrocodone and everything over time and mm-hmm. you know and I still kind of struggle with that a little bit and so um you know but those aches and pain there isn't like a blueprint of you know, hey, here's somebody with your disease that went through all these treatments and, you know, here's the program lined up for how to how to do that. And so, you know, um, you know, it's, it's a to try to recover, you know, during the height of COVID, you know, I just so alone. And so, you know, a lot of my be able to explain, you know, how my uh, my I physically feel there's no, you, you know, there's no checks and balances. So there's nobody to come home to at the end of the day and be like, hey, how's your day? And so, mm-hmm. um you know, after a while, especially during those times, it just, it, it became majorly draining. And, you know, I got into doing a little bit of advocacy by joining support groups and telling my story. And the more I did mm-hmm. that, the more uh, it made me feel that, you know, what I went through was definitely meaningful. And when I share it, you know, there's a huge response, you know, about it. And so I just was deciding that I was at some point, you know, going to figure out a way to do this full time. I don't know how. Um you know, but this is what I want to do. You know, Mm -hmm. this was my life's, you know, thing. I don't want to go back to just, you know, being a home builder or getting a job to have a job. I, I really want to do something meaningful and this and that. And so that's literally what I've been doing the last year, trying to get engaged and involved, you know, um, in every way, shape, form, fashion that I can. But, um, you know, all the, the different physical things that I go through, I can try to look into filing for disability and, you know, mm-hmm. even though it would take much to get it, I mean, I, there's no way I could live off of that, you know, because mm-hmm. I only put in, you know, I'm 41 now. So I only put in so many right. years into the system and I'd only get so much back. And so I, I you know, I built a house when I was sick, you know, and so I, I feel just like anybody else. So, um, you know, it's tough because there's, there's not like a list of people that are my age that had my disease, you know, that are walking around talking about it. And so, um, you know, the average age is, uh, I think 70 years old to get diagnosed with this. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Okay. It, that, I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's some other cases, you know, a lot, you know, I know a lot of folks right now that are, um, in their late forties, early fifties, you know, which is on average the closest to my age group. And so, you know, it's, trying to reach out in other ways possible that I can get that connection. And so it's yeah, just hard, yeah. you know, for, to, to explain it sometimes for others to really understand, you know, and it can be frustrating. Um, you know, well, uh, you, you, you're kind of leading me right into the next question, uh, with everything, uh, opening up, they took away the, uh, the mandates, quarantine. the quarantine, quarantine mandates, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, because of the pandemic, what are you looking forward to in the next year? 
with a little bit more freedom on your hands? Um, more, more travel, literally, uh, you know, in the last uh, year or so, um, a lot more opportunities have been coming up, um, to be able to, you know, go around and, and get involved and tell my story. And so, um, they, I was able to go to Washington DC, both in March with, the uh, with the MRF and do advocacy days with them. And then also again here about a week or so ago with the community oncology Alliance and do advocacy days. And uh, both of them, this is their first time, I think, back in person since prior to the pandemic. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all that other, uh, every everything for the last couple of years has been virtual. You, that in-person connection that you get when mm-hmm. you're actually able to go in person mm-hmm. and tell your story and make that event, mm-hmm. I feel is makes uh, is completely different than doing it virtually, you know, because you can, there's just a vibe you can feel when you're in right. person mm-hmm. right. and, you know, to it just sinks in better. And so um, being able to travel around and go to conventions and conferences uh, and things of that nature to where before, uh, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to get involved or engage, it's all virtual. Okay. So I'm really Thank looking you. forward to doing more of that. Good. And and we look forward to hearing more hearing about more, your, yeah. Yeah, your travels. And Chris, um, with all of your advocacy work and everything, and you're trying to um, educate and uh, explain your story to others, have you considered um, writing a book or maybe like a graphic novel? Yeah, I actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I, I have and I want to. I just, I don't have a clue where to start or how to, you know, who to reach out to to get it going. But absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I yeah. guess we will email a couple of links. Okay. All yeah. right. Uh, let me make a note. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I would love to do and, that. Uh, yeah. And I think graphic novels are, you know, I... I Dominic over there, our sound engineer, uh, I was asking his daughter, like, we have, you know, old, old books, um, bound books. And I said, oh, you know, like, we have um, the Scarlet Letter. I said, but that's probably not something you're really into. And she goes, oh, yeah, I read the Scarlet Letter. And I said, and the Diary of Anne Frank. She goes, oh, yeah, the Diary of Anne Frank. I have that graphic novel. And I was like, oh. Wow. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> Floored, yeah. So, it seems uh, like wow. really hard information yeah. can be conveyed in a graphic novel and hard information that I didn't even consider. So I thought your uh, story kind of sounds perfect where you wouldn't normally think of it that way, but it might be the the easiest way to get the information across. Mm-hmm. Oh, that 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 sounds absolutely wonderful. I, yeah, I've thought about that a lot over time. And, you know, because I always have these images in my mind, like if I were to draw it out what it would look like mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. um, absolutely that that would be wonderful yeah and even like just um not just but images of like what your body what's going on inside you know oh yeah um emotionally and both and physically and chemically all of that might be portrayed really interestingly as well mm-hmm. oh. absolutely uh, right chris what can somebody do for a friend or family member that was recently diagnosed with cancer. Like you were saying that your family made you a blanket and that that made a significant difference, but what else can someone do? Right. Um, well, you know, one, one, they can just, you know, obviously, you know, to be there for them, um, if they ever call, you know, for any, for any reason, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, you're not in a position to pick it up. You're busy, you know, make that that one exception where you step away, you know, and just pick it up and go take the call, you know, even if you got to leave the room, that I mean, they don't know when they're calling necessarily all the time what you're, you're literally doing, but that sometimes, you know, just being able to have somebody on the other end can, can do a lot. Um, another thing, and I didn't think about this while I was going through my treatment, but I wish I would have done it now, um, mm-hmm. which is, you know, cr- uh, have them, you know, if they offer to create a GoFundMe page for you, let them do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I, I was stubborn in, when I was going through my deal and I, um, you know, it's like, no, if you're going to do that, then do it and give it to charity. You know, I was like, I still mm-hmm. got a job. And, you know, I didn't, you know, I, nobody has a clue like what the long term or short term mm-hmm. ramifications financially are going to be or where you're going to have to go and what it's going to entail and what's going to cost. I mean, you know, I had my family and everything with me to help out, you know, but, um, you know, that takes a toll on them, too, you know. Sure. And so, um, you know, that. That right there is automatically just like, yeah, that's that's when it's also the most effective. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I tried to do one when I was, you know, trying to recover from my depression that I went through, you know, the last year and everything, you know, um, and it's like, it does, it's not as effective, you know, when you're, as when you're actually going through it, people are more likely to help you, you know, to get where you need to go when you, when you're most desperate, you know, need, to, you know, of help. And, um, 
you know, a lot of the specialists, they're not always local. So you, there's going to be travel entailed. So, uh, you know, doing that, um, you know, uh, meal trains or any kind of someone's offering to bring you food, you know, I'll never turn down food. <laughs> you know, you don't know if you're necessary. I mean, if they want to bring it to you, I mean, you don't know if you're hungry or not, if you're going to like it or this and that. I mean, that'll always come and go and change, you know, depending on your treatment and how you're feeling or whatnot. But, um, you know, that's just another act of kindness that somebody cares and they, they want to help. They just don't know how. And so, um, you know, that is one way. Um, another way is, uh, like, uh, gift cards, you know, for, you know, other restaurants or, mm -hmm. you know, just visa cards or, you know, so they can go shopping and buy the groceries or they can use it for travel and gas, if, you know, wherever they're at. Those, those are kind of help because that's not being terribly specific, you know, and having mm -hmm. to, you know, corner yourself in, I'm dedicating for this trip and this cause is just going to mm -hmm. be like, Hey, I want to mm -hmm. help. I don't know how, or this and that. Some people don't know the right thing to, to necessarily always say. So getting a card, you know, um, oftentimes, you know, can say more, you know, by, you know, the pictures and, you know, a few words than right, verbally right. expressing it, but just the, the, the act of, Hey, you went out and got your, a card and then it's somebody, I mean, that, that can always be huge. Um, right. You know, those are always a lot better, I think, than sometimes a lot of flowers and other things because a lot mm -hmm. of sense, you know, people can get real sensitive um, with their senses uh, when they're going mm -hmm. through treatments and everything. And so, so um, just got to be cognizant of a lot of that too, as well. Okay. okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Great advice. Yeah. Um, and Chris, what advice do you have for someone who's recently been diagnosed with metastatic mucosal melanoma? Number one piece of advice is be mm -hmm. aggressive. Um, okay. be extremely aggressive, um, it, uh, uh, attack it, you know, um, fast and vigilantly, um, and, you know, make sure that you are, you know, your, your oncology team that you're working with, you know, has experience with mucosal melanoma. Um, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not like, Hey, I'm a melanoma specialist or I, you know, somebody that actually had, you know, asked, asked those doctors, how many patients with mucosal melanoma? Mm -hmm. Or be more, you know, have they seen in the right. last, you know, and then throw out some things, but try to, try to find that out. Um, you know, I was in the recruiting business for a while and you oftentimes might come across somebody who might have something similar, but you really want to have somebody that's, um, has some hands-on experience and that, you know, is, is on your side. Um, uh, you know, you've got to, you're putting the captain of the ship, you know, and in place and you want to make sure that you steer them in the right direction. So you set the tone, but. Um, you know, the, the cancer oftentimes it's, it's known to metastasize, um, you know, uh, they're known to, um, you know, travel quickly and be sneaky. So, you know, neoadjuvant therapy, if, if you can get systemic therapy before a surgery, you know, um, that's always been the you know, showing that that is helping quite a bit, um, you know, than just adjuvant, which is having systemic therapy after surgery, you know, because after that, the cells are already on their way, but if you can get some right. systemic therapy prior to scaring away the, the tumor, then, mm -hmm. you know, they're already being placed. So even if it's just one dose, you know, and then you do mm -hmm. surgery the next day, I've seen cases like that. You know, I do Zoom calls, weekly Zoom calls in my, uh, we post a melanoma community, um, both, um, you know, on this hemisphere and internationally, you know, including mm -hmm. like Australia. And so, mm -hmm. um, and it's every week, um, you know, and oftentimes, you know, there's up to about 20 people on a call. And so, times that every week throughout the year, you know, and it's like, you get the consensus of, you know, what's right, what's right. working and what what's not working, and what doesn't. you know, Absolutely. so, but yeah, but, you know, be aggressive, uh, be positive, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, find, find, find a solid care team with experience, you know, and if you don't know, ask them if they can, you know, point you to who the right guy is. I mean, that would mean more to a patient knowing that person they went to was straight up and honest, you know, and did a good thing that's, you know, said, Hey, this is very complex, you know, just like my oncologist did, you know, and what you really do need is a specialist in this and all that she'd love, you know, love to help you. You got to go see this person and see, you know, have the, you know, they'll start making the calls and helping you get to where mm -hmm. you need to go. Great. Great. Okay. Excellent advice. Yeah. What do you wish that all healthcare providers knew about patients living with cancer, waiting for a diagnosis or going through treatment process? Oh, that's another really good, uh, good one right there. Uh, I wish all the healthcare providers, uh, you know, actually, you know, had um, acted as if it was themselves or their loved ones that was going through it. 
um, you know, as, you know, with the sense of urgency with, um, you know, the quality of care, uh, you know, just the, the service you get, you know, when you have to sit on hold and try to get, you know, your answers, you know, you can get uh, tossed around from phone call to switchboard and mm-hmm. so forth. And, you know, what's, what's going on in, in either that caretaker or that other patient's, you know, mind while, while they're, while they're waiting, um, right. you know, right. they be, be very, just kind of open to listening to what the, you know, it should be a partnership. Um, I wish, you know what I'm saying? That instead of, you know, instead of a pay, you know, necessarily just a patient, you know, right. um, but the patients are the ones that are paying the bills, you know, and mm-hmm. are seeking the care. And so, you know, a lot of patients, sometimes I understand they're kind of hesitant to really want to engage within that partnership with their doctors because doctors and historically have just been known to be the guys that are right. They know what to do, you know, but with this, these kind of cancers and these new therapies, I mean, you know, we're all learning together. And so, you know, between the clinical side that they knowledge and they gain, and then the patient side, you know, with their involvement, you know, with others, I mean, uh, it's, that's gotta be a collaboration with, you know, the patients, you know, being partners and not just considered the patients. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. And you had said, Chris, that, um, you know, obviously depression came into play. Um, was mental health care incorporated in your overall care? Was it something that your health care providers, you know, Suggested, suggested yeah. or was you know a health care a mental health care provider incorporated into the overall care team or is that something you had to seek out separately it was definitely something i had to seek out separately i had to um you know and that's what i did you know in my recovery care because when i was going through the middle of all my care and everything they would it mm-hmm. would be like you know like a bullet on the bottom of your you know paperwork or something but mm-hmm. Unless I think that you yourself brought it up and said, you know, hey, this is, um, I'm really seeking this. I'm really wanting that, you know, um, they weren't going out of your way to go, you know, hey, if you really need some quality therapy or you need, you know, any kind of counseling, uh, you know, we really recommend this place or recommend that place or we can help you get to the, you know, um, I I wish there was more of that because if I kind of knew the availability, maybe I wouldn't have hit, you know, my own emotions and feelings, you know, undercover and, you know, and, and maybe kind of approached it, but, you know, also by, by doing it the way I did was able to kind of keep me in the spot of, you know, it's, it's working, keep going. But I, if it would have been available, I, I probably would have, uh, you know, addressed it more and took, took, you know, okay. took advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of people don't know what's available. Right. And yeah. it's not included as, as it's, part of the, a package. Yeah, yeah. No. It, it's hard. But, it's hard to ask for, you know, or well, if you, you know don't what, know what, yeah. When we first started Podcast DX, it was because of um, one of our cousins who had to get a liver transplant. And as it turned out, you'll have to listen to that episode, but as it turned out, um, the doctors or the team at Duke University they encompassed everything. I mean, there, you know, there was a meeting with well, they, every patient. They realized that, you know. You need mental health you care. You need You need health nutrition. Because, you need, right, right. You need it the all pharmacy. Is, it's all yeah. part of the whole. And, and it, they included yeah. it for every patient. And you had no choice. You had to go to the appointment. Yes. So I appreciated that. Oh. Uh, it made it yeah. so much easier. And it, actually, that's the same, that's the same uh type of work planning that mm-hmm. Mayo Clinic uses. Mm-hmm. Where it's more of a... And, and it's all a team. You have know. to have, yeah. You, you get a, the whole it's a, team. It's a big part. And dealing with a cancer diagnosis is is big. It's it's emotionally, it's going to take a toll. Right, right. Uh, Chris, abs- you... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just I was saying I absolutely agree. Yeah, with the let's, toll it's let's like. advocate for that. Um, Chris, you already talked about some of the ways that people can help financially, uh, a, a friend or a family member that has cancer, but what can employers help with? What can government programs support? Uh, what would you like to see in the future? I know you're doing advocacy. What are you looking for um, as, as far as a financial assistance for other patients? Uh, another really good uh, question. Um, you you ultimately you know to to get more treatments, you need clinical trials and you need clinical trial participation. And a lot of the factors that will come into a patient's mind when thinking about you know clinical trials are obviously you know are the cost. 
uh, you know, most of the trials do require, you know, you've got to go there, uh, you know, and it, it, not at least for the whole deal, but at least for your consent and everything. Most of the time, I mean, you, you have to at least uh, get to the uh, institution that's having this study to, you know, cite consent and also, you know, for treatment. Some of them, you know, is a one-time treatment there. You go home and sometimes you have to stay there. Or in my case, you know, you have to go back to that location for my follow-ups. Uh, you know, during COVID, uh, we discovered that, you know, between, um, you know, the telehealth that, mm -hmm. you know, I could scan here in Texas and then send my disc to Colorado and do a, a telehealth visit and go over my results. And, you know, I could do labs here as well and any other kind of follow-up appointments needed. Well, since those restrictions had ended, um, now it's required that I got to go back. And so that's an additional Ooh. cost, well, well, you know, well, in terms of... Whoa. Why you know, wouldn't I have they to, allow you to continue to save well, money? Yeah, well... Because, yeah, be, because you know, somebody... I mean, there, maybe there's it's an insurance thing or it's a study rule wow. or something, but wow. I mean... I, uh, I mean, yeah, that so, um, I, that you know, I, I gotta either save up and use my, my airline miles or, you know, mm -hmm. oftentimes I drive, you know, my, my grandparents and, uh, and aunts and everything, they still live out there, but they don't live in Aurora anymore. They moved to Parker, so it's not as close, but it's still with, you know, a decent, it's an okay drive and everything, but, um, yeah, yeah, that, that kind of cost, <laughs> yeah. you know, but yeah. the, the, you know, it's as simple as the clinical trial access, um, you know. It's, it's the, if, if their programs are in place to where it's like, look, all your, uh, your travel's taken care of, or, you know, you know, instead of all that, you know, we'll work with your current, you know, oncology team or local hospital. So you can do as much as you can where you're at, you know, instead of having it and do all these other costs and you can still participate. I mean, even as simple when I was going through, uh, my main source of treatment, I went down to Houston MD Anderson for my treatment, but. They just did, uh, I did my follow-ups there and radiation and one major surgery, but anything chemotherapy related or immunotherapy related, I was able mm -hmm. to do up here in Dallas because, you know, it's just, it's a drug, you know, that they prescribed and they can mix and I go and I sit in a chair and they give it to me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, being able to like, all the, you know, it's the, the purposes of why, you know, unless, you know, the, of, of physically having that specific doctor, like put hands, you know, or seeing like a physical thing, I mean, like. You know, they could still work that out with your current oncologist. You could still get labs, you know. Um, and so a lot of those, you know, restrictions, unless, you know, they're going to be paid for, then, you know, they need to kind of alter those. But, you know, the clinical trial access is just that some things are so specific, you know, when, you, when you're looking into getting into a trial that, you know, it could be exhausting. And so there's, you know, it's got to be broken down to, you know, uh, more wide variety for you know applicants to get in you know or have more options you know especially for rare rare diseases and cancers um right but the telehealth factor uh that i mean that's that's universally across the board that was one of the things i was advocate for in washington was you know to make it go you know all 50 states you know state to state you know some states right now you can still do it with and then other states you can't because there's an insurance deal you know you might have to go sit in a parking lot on the other side of the border from your phone to do mm -hmm. your call for it to be an in stay Zoom call, but I didn't that right know there. that. I didn't realize oh, that yeah. that wasn't available everywhere. No. Nope. Yeah. Well, okay. well, I'll, Chris, this has been an eye opener for me, mm -hmm. um, and and a tear jerker for Jean. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time to call us today. Most pleasure. Uh, most definitely, it was my pleasure. I I can't thank y'all enough for bringing me on. Well, and Chris, how can we learn more about you and your advocacy work? Um, I'm on uh, many social media handles. Uh, melanoma survivor, uh, dot com is my website. Um, and uh, from there is where I post, uh, you know, many blogs, pictures, different events that I'm getting involved with that are coming up, um, fundraising activities I'm involved with or different Places that have, um, you know, published my survivor story, um, you know, and so it, it's a link tree also I'm connected to on all of my uh, email signatures, but mucosamelanomerasurvivor.com. Okay. Okay. Thank we will you. include a link to that on our website Absolutely. for this episode. Right, right. Thank you very well, much. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And um, yeah, I, I, I just, it's been a lot. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's overdrawn, over overdrawn. No, I, I might be, I might be overdrawn, <laughs> but that's a whole nother matter. Over, overwrought. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but thank you. Um, yeah, I think hearing your story is going to help a lot of people. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if our listeners have any questions or comments about today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com. And uh, if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. And as always, please remember that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical di- advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and always with the advice of your, your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regime and never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this podcast. Till next week. Thank you.